I'm Ian Whitaker, and this is perhaps the ultimate set of behind the scenes and production photos from Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. The accompanying commentary will focus on providing insight into the film's production and observations about the film itself. Stanley's daughter Vivian with a chimp from the set of 2001. This is one of the two infant chimpanzees that were used in the film. All the other apes were of course actors. Here you can see one of the ape men concepts that never made it to the final movie. It seems like when Kubrick didn't know the answer to the question he had, he always liked to try various solutions until something stood out as the correct answer. The centrifuge was manufactured for the production by British engineering company Vickers Armstrong. Aircraft manufacturers and shipbuilders, both for the private industry and the arms industry. Stuart Freeborn, nicknamed the grandfather of modern makeup design, was charged not only with creating the apes for the prehistoric introduction to the movie, he was also tasked with the ageing effects necessary for lead character Kier Dweller, Dave. Freeborn worked alongside his wife Kathy and his son Graham, and their work included 2001, Oliver Twist, Bridge on the River Kwai, The Omen, Superman, Top Secret, The Great Muppet Caper, the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, Chewbacca, the Ewoks and Yoda. Apparently Yoda's face was a combination of Albert Einstein and Stewart's. It's something once you've heard it, it's kind of difficult to unhear it when you look at him. Kubrick did an interview with Playboy magazine about the movie. Here are a couple of things that he said in that interview. The very nature of the visual experience in 2001 is to give the viewer an instantaneous visceral reaction that does not and should not require further amplification. Just speaking generally, however, I would say that there are elements in any good film that would increase the viewer's interest and appreciation on a second viewing. The momentum of a movie often prevents every stimulating detail or nuance from having a full impact the first time it's seen. The whole idea that a movie should be seen only once is an extension of our traditional conception of the film as an ephemeral entertainment rather than a visual work of art. We don't believe that we should hear a great piece of music only once, or see a painting once, or read a great book just once, but the film has until recent years been exempted from the category of art, a situation I'm glad is finally changing. The wheels on this buggy mounted with a camera are actually to allow it to remain still while the set is moving. Here we have a look at a specially modified camera lens that takes shots from Hal's point of view. Pierre Boulat taking stills at dawn assisted by Catherine Gear to use for the prehistoric segments that start the film off. The Namib Desert, January 1967. The Namib Desert is a coastal desert in southern Africa. This extraordinary land was used as a location also for Mad Max Fury Road 2015. If cocoa boom trees served as an inspiration and a very distant background in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Studio prop of Discovery's dish antenna full size. When asked by Playboy magazine how he was able to achieve such remarkable special effects for the movie, Kubrick replied, I can't answer that question technically in the time that we have available, but I can say that it was necessary to conceive, design and engineer completely new techniques in order to produce the special effects. 
This took 18 months and six and a half million dollars out of a ten and a half million dollar budget. I think an extraordinary amount of credit must go to Robert H. O'Brien, the president of MGM, who had sufficient faith to allow me to persevere at what must have at times appeared to be a task without end. But I felt it was necessary to make this film in such a way that every special effects shot in it would be completely convincing, something that had never before been accomplished in a motion picture. An early concept of the pyramid monolith. Arthur C. Clarke said of the pyramid that it was a shape which inspired all sorts of philosophical and scientific speculations and the art department constructed models of various sizes but somehow they never looked right and there was always the danger that they would arouse wholly irrelevant associations with the pyramids. Another of Stuart Freeborn's concepts of what early man looked like four million years ago. Stuntman Bill Weston filming a spacewalk scene launching from a platform 30 feet above the concrete studio floor. Allegedly afterwards, Bill needed to recover from oxygen deprivation as a consequence of being suspended in the air with the mask on. Terry Duggan at Southampton Zoo, practicing teaching an animal to pounce on him and play fight in a way that looks convincing as if he's being attacked or the Dawn of Man sequence at the start of the movie. Towards the end of the movie, we see a room which has this ceiling as its floor. Kubrick with his daughter Vivian on set. She had cameos in a number of his movies, including Space Odyssey, Barry Lyndon. She shot behind-the-scenes documentary of The Shining at the age of 24, and she composed a score for Full Metal Jacket under the persuadium of Abigail Mead. Apes, Simon Davis and Richard Woods. Actor and mime Dan Richter poses in one of Freeborn's body shoots for a costume test. Richter also played the part of Moonwatcher, the lead ape man at the beginning of the movie. This briefcase computer was designed by Honeywell specifically for the film. Stanley Kubrick next to Arthur C. Clarke on set. Originally, they'd written a narration together for the movie. It's quite common to see that the movie was based on a novel by Arthur C. Clarke, but actually he wrote the novel after finishing the draft screenplay. And as Kubrick said himself, the novel's a totally different kind of experience and there are a number of differences between the book and the movie. For example, the novel explains things much more explicitly than the film does. The novel came from a 130-page draft of the film at the very outset. But Arthur also took his impression of some of the rushes of the film whilst he was completing the novel. So the novel and the film originated from the same draft screenplay, but from there on they took fairly different paths. Kubrick next to one of Hal's ancestors. Douglas Trumbull working on the moon bus. 
In a 2014 Hollywood Reporter interview, Douglas Trumbull said that he didn't feel that Kubrick really earned the 2001 visual effects Oscar, but that he did deserve Oscars for his talents as a director and as a writer, but not the special effects. It was his opinion that the special effects weren't designed by Kubrick so much as for people who worked on them. And there was some rule that didn't allow four people to be credited and win an award. And as he tells it, it was this technical issue that likely led to Kubrick being credited for the special effects. In a 1970 interview, Kubrick said that from the very outset of work on the film, we all discussed means of photographically depicting extraterrestrial creatures in a manner that would be as mind-boggling as the being itself. And it soon became apparent that you cannot imagine the unimaginable. All you can do is try to represent it in an artistic manner that will convey something of its quality. That's why we settled on the black monolith, which is, of course, in itself, something of a Jungian archetype and also a pretty fair example of minimal art. Arthur C. Clarke also commented on the use of the monolith in the movie. Our ultimate solution now seems to me the only possible one, but before arriving at it we spent months imagining strange worlds and cities and creatures in the hope of finding something that would produce the right shock of recognition. All this material was abandoned but I would not say that any of it was unnecessary. It contained the alternatives that had to be eliminated and therefore first had to be created. Just as a sculptor, it is said, chips down through the stone toward the figure concealed within. Later on in this video, you'll get to see some of the abandoned material that depicted aliens. It's interesting to note that Kubrick used the same off green in Eyes Wide Shut also. In this photo, next to Stanley Kubrick, is Jeffrey Unsworth. He is the Oscar-winning cinematographer of many films, including 2001 A Space Odyssey, Superman 1, Superman 2, Cabaret, Tess, Murder on the Orient Express, and Beckett. Unsworth won a BAFTA for his camera work on 2001 A Space Odyssey. Clark wrote the following about the monolith. The famous monolith, which has caused so much controversy and bafflement, was in itself the end product of a considerable evolution. In the beginning, the alien artefact had been a black tetrahedron, the simplest and most fundamental of all regular solids, formed of four equal triangles. Note the shape of the coffee dispensers has the same sarcophagus coffin shape as the hibernation pods.
an early design of the Prehumans by Stuart Freeborn. Freeborn's original conception for the Dawn of Man sequence in 2001 was based on early Neville Andal Man. For the monolith, Kubrick also considered using a transparent cube. He had a three-ton cube of lucite cast, the largest ever made. Lucite is a high-quality, durable acrylic resin. MGM Boreham Wood Studios, March 1966. Stanley Kubrick has his command post besides the centrifuge set, Jeffrey Unsworth, Pamela Carlton, John Alcott and Gary Lockwood. concept art painted for the production by special effects artist Bruce Logan. The BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation, the world's oldest national broadcaster owned by the British government. is quite a curious choice given that you're compelled to pay an annual license fee on penalty of fines or prison if you own a television, even if you don't actually watch any of their channels. Douglas Trumbull with a machine devised to create shots of the planet Jupiter. Exposures were acquired in a completely darkened room in which only the projected slits of the painted artwork were visible to the camera. This Jupiter machine was also used in the film for the famous Stargate sequence. Mixed media artist and sculptor Joy Cuff made several plaster tabletop models of the moon and its complex surface, used for shots of the film of the moon bus travelling over the surface of the moon and the views from the spacecraft windows. The tabletop models measured 3 by 6 feet within one 10 foot square area and an interacting long set for a tracking shot of approximately 25 feet. Joy would work from thumbnail sketches, some created by her with some simple drawings drawn by Stanley Kubrick. Mere diagrams to show surface planes and crater edges, but all to be very carefully composed on set. Joy worked with matte artist Bob Cuff and cameraman John McKay until they left to form a company together. She then worked alone until Roger Dickin arrived. A drawing of the space station docking area by concept artist Roy Cameron. He would later work on Superman, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars Return of the Jedi.
Bruce Logan shooting animation for 2001. In his Playboy interview about 2001, Kubrick also said, I will say that the God concept is at the heart of 2001, but not any traditional anthropomorphic image of God. I don't believe in any of Earth's monotheistic religions, but I do believe that one can construct an intriguing scientific definition of God once you accept the fact that there are approximately 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone, that each star is a life-giving sun, and that there are approximately 100 billion galaxies in just the visible universe. Given a planet in a stable orbit, not too hot and not too cold, and given a few billion years of chance chemical reactions created by the interaction of a sun's energy on the planet's chemicals, it's fairly certain that life in one form or another will eventually emerge. It's reasonable to assume that there must be in fact countless billions of such planets where biological life has arisen, and the odds of some proportion of such life developing intelligence are high. Now, the Sun is by no means an old star, and its planets are mere children in cosmic age, so it seems like there are billions of planets in the universe, not only where intelligent life is on a lower scale than man, but other billions where it is approximately equal, and others still where it is hundreds of thousands of millions of years in advance of us. When you think of the giant technological strides that man has made in a few millennia, less than a microsecond in the chronology of the universe, can you imagine the evolutionary development that much older life forms have taken? They may have progressed from biological species, which are fragile shells for the mind at best, into immortal machine entities, and then over innumerable eons they could emerge from the chrysalis of matter transformed into beings of pure energy and spirit. Their potentialities would be limitless, and their intelligence ungraspable by humans. This wide-angle photo taken by Kubrick features various members of the art department, John Graysmark, John Fenner, Tony Redding and Alan Tompkins, who were all draftsmen for the feature film. So what would happen if all your food was just mush and liquid? Well, we already know that because studies of our ancestors who ate much more substantial food show that they had straight teeth. And our teeth are very poorly aligned because we don't eat such coarse food. So we'd definitely have dental problems. Secondly, it'd be boring. No crunchy food, no textures. This wooden model was constructed during the concept stage of the production and provided a basis for miniature models and the full-size craft used during the shoot. It has hand-drawn pencil markings indicating the positioning of lights and additional details, some of which are seen in the final iteration. This concept model can be seen on the table during the production still showing the art department. In the foreground, from left to right, we have Stanley Kubrick, George Muller, who was the senior manager at NASA on the Apollo moon landing program, Arthur C. Clarke, and scientific advisor Frederick Ordway in the cricket top. Far right is Deke Slayton, head of the American Astronaut Office. Some more photos featuring Frederick Ordway, top official at NASA, who became chief technical consultant and scientific advisor for 2001. For almost two years, he was one of Kubrick's most essential advisors. He even moved his family to England for the production.
Canadian actress Chella Matheson played the role of receptionist on board the space station. These photos come from Tom Spina Designs in New York. They were trusted to restore one of the ape costumes from Space Odyssey. Here you can see that the foam latex on the hands had quite a bit of wear. There was also a lot of wear on the foot from the original costume and the other foot was missing so they had to create a replica. This particular costume is for a female example of the man apes. In fact the costume had a functional nursing mechanism so the actor could give milk to a live chimp baby adding another layer of realism to the movie. Stanley Kubrick, Playboy interview on 2001. Why should a vastly superior race bother to harm or destroy us? If an intelligent ant suddenly traced a message in the sand at my feet reading, I'm sentient, let's talk things over, I doubt very much that I would rush to grind him under my heel. Even if they weren't super intelligent though, but merely more advanced than mankind, I would tend to lean more towards the benevolence or at least indifference theory since it's most unlikely that we would be visited from within our own solar system, any society capable of traversing light years of space would have to have an extremely high degree of control over matter and energy. Therefore, what possible motivation for hostility would they have? To steal our gold or oil or coal? It's hard to think of any nasty intention that would justify the long and arduous journey from another star. Who could have predicted in 1900 what life in 1968 would be like? Technology is, in many ways, more predictable than human behaviour. Politics and world affairs change so quickly that it's difficult to predict the future of social institutions for even 10 years with a modicum of accuracy. By 2001, we could be living in a Gandhi-esque paradise where all men are brothers or in a neo-fascist dictatorship or be muddling along about the way we are today. As technology evolves, however, there's little doubt that the whole concept of leisure will be both quantitatively and qualitatively improved. Quite a number of alien concepts were made for the ending of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Although none of them were used and it was decided only to hint indirectly at alien life rather than show it. Another idea was to use black dots which were just stamped out of a black piece of paper. They got the largest paper hole puncher they could and stamped out perfect rounds of black paper. These were then glued all over white clothing, from head to toe. They were placed evenly all over the actor. The artist was then put in front of a white background with the same size black dots all over it. Stood still, they would disappear into the background just like a predator kind of effect. But when they moved, you could make out a shape. Dan Richter, who played Moonwatcher, the leader of the eight-man pack, actually talked about this experiment in his book, Moonwatcher's Memoirs. In an entry of his diary dated September the 5th, 1967, he recalled Kubrick asking him to stay longer after finishing the ape scenes and shooting some footage using the polka dot suit. Elongated humanoid aliens, not unlike those we can see in the film AI. At the bottom of this painting, some small insect-like aliens can be seen. They were later described by Arthur Clarke in a script draft. Some of the alien concepts were made from light or electronic signals. Others, physical ones, seemed to be inspired by demons or gargoyles. Stanley's daughter, Katharina Kubrick, wrote that My mother, Christiane, also spent time making aliens out of clay in her studio at Abbot's Mead. They were cast in rubber and painted in weird colours, and I'm guessing they could have been manipulated a la Muppets. Of course, they were never used and ended up dotted around the garden. 
too funny to see people react to these rather unusual garden gnomes. The Russian scientist in the green dress is played by Christina Ma. Model and actress Edwina Carroll, who you may have also seen in Blue Murder at Centrinians and Carry On Up the Jungle. When interviewed in 2022, she reflected that my career highlight has to be working on 2001. Having the opportunity to work with such a well-respected director like Kubrick was just amazing. All the cast and crew were pretty fearful of getting anything wrong as they wanted to impress. I remember having to walk in the rain from my dressing room to the set, which was quite a distance. When Stanley found out about this, he immediately arranged a portable dressing room to be put near to the set so I wouldn't get cold or wet and could quickly and comfortably get to where I needed to be. He was so kind and so considerate, as well as being a true genius. Art director Harry Lange's design for the spacesuit. Actress Penny Brams, who plays a stewardess on board the Lunar Shuttle Ares, was only 15 years old when shooting 2001 in 1966. In this deleted scene, Floyd calls Macy's and buys his daughter the promised Bush baby. costumes for 2001 were designed by Hardy Ames, born in 1909 in London. Ames will always be remembered for dressing Queen Elizabeth II. He died March 2003, aged 93. Ames's business grew to be worth more than £200 million. When asked which collection was his favourite, he always replied the next one. This is a pair of unused United States Astronautics Agency stickers from the film. The USAA logo appeared on many spacesuits and equipment used for the Discovery mission. One sticker is 6 centimeters and the other is 1.2 centimeters. Special effects supervisor Con Pedersen working on a preliminary design sketch for the Discovery spacecraft. William Sylvester and Wally Vivers during production. A very happy Arthur C. Clarke here posing outside the cinema. <laughs> 